Thank you, uh, Dean, for that introduction. Thank you for that prayer this morning. What a luxury it is to be able to start a meeting with, with the prayer today. And I am honored and humbled to be with you uh, this morning. Um, I've had the opportunity over the last several years to be able to engage with business school students and more recently now engineering students, thanks to uh, uh, Dean Jim Trant. And I'd say I am more and more impressed every time I have those conversations. Not only that you're more prepared than I was, and that's a pretty low, low bar, I guess, but than I was when I was your age, but I am more impressed that you are ready to compete in the marketplace and that BYU and the foundation that you're building here is like no other foundation and just being here you can take a little bit of peace and knowledge that you're at the right place and that you're getting the right experiences to really set you off on any direction that you want to go in your careers so we'll launch off in, into this i'm going to be talking a lot and it's going to be one-dimensional about careers i think as you think about careers, though, is think about it, and, and it's important to keep it in perspective, right? You're going you're gonna to end up spending a lot of time, a lot of your waking hours uh, at your job and, and developing your career, and you need to be thinking about how do I balance that with my faith, my family, my health, relationships, and if you build those anchors, and put time into building those anchors, you will be much more successful in your careers than if you're one-dimensional and focused on it. Now, I'm not necessarily the best person to teach about balance. I will confess, I nearly missed the birth of two of my five children. Uh, one, I was in Japan. The other one, I was in Germany, and it was only the iron will of my wife, Darcy, that she was not going to have that child before I got back that, that I didn't miss it. But what I would say, as you think about your careers, they require a lot of flexibility and sacrifices, but you got to think about what are the things that you are willing to sacrifice in your career and the different things that you're going to do. And what are the must-dos that you got to do to invest in some of those anchors, other anchors in your life? And you will be much more successful as you go uh, as you go forward. So this is not meant to be, hey, here's the prescription for the model career. Engineering gives you the opportunity to go in all sorts of different paths. And I'll, I, I'm going to show you the one path that I've been on. But more importantly, what I want to do is share experiences and lessons that have been impactful to me and that I hope might give you something to think about as you're going through some of the decisions that you're going through, whether it be maybe you're still choosing your major, maybe you're thinking about your uh, first internship, maybe you're thinking about your first job, whatever it might be that might be helpful for you uh, with re respect to that. So this is the CEPSIC plan. Uh, I have a hard time articulating just what the impact BYU has had on our family. Um, as was mentioned, I graduated from here. Uh, more importantly, I met my wife, uh, Darcy, here at one of those cheesy type of activities where a guy's apartment was put together with a girl's apartment in the same ward for a Sunday afternoon dinner, and that's where I met her for the first time. So I would say don't sacrifice too many of those social events for for academics. You need to find a balance there too because they can really pay off in the long term as well. The reason I got my master's degree here was, I will say, it was primarily because I could graduate in, with a master's in one more year of school. And to me, that felt like a worthwhile sacrifice for the value of, of getting a master's degree. So if you're wondering or thinking about that, I don't know if you can still do it in that time frame. But if you can, I would really think about uh, the value a master's degree can bring in the time. And I know you're excited because you're getting close to, you know, senior and graduation. It's difficult to think about going. But the things that you'll learn there will serve you really well. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But some of the decisions that you're going to make, some of the best choices I've ever made, whether it's a place to go to work or, or graduate or whatever, 
was who I was going to go work with or work for. You know, it said that your satisfaction in your job is primarily about the people that you're directly working with or for. And I would say my master's degree was a great example of that. I didn't know what I wanted to do a master's degree in. I just knew who I wanted to do it with. So there, at the time, Professor Brett Webb was uh, on the uh, mechanical engineering faculty and had a great reputation and a couple of people I knew were doing master's degree for him. So I approached him and, and told him, you know, I wanted to do it with him. And he said, great, what do you want to do it in? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just know I want to do it with you. And I'm sure he was like, well, lucky me. Um, and it, But he never voiced that. Uh, and what I'd say is the faculty and staff here at BYU, what I found, are so aligned with wanting your success. So don't hesitate to reach out to him. It was one of the best decisions I've made, the things that I learned from him, sort of the rigor of thought and, and, and asking why and thought processes that went in with, with my master's degree were so beneficial uh, in my career. And I'll, I'll talk to some of that. But so when I decided to be an engineer, I had no idea what an engineer did. So I, I, I didn't know anybody who was an engineer, to tell you the truth. And so after my first year of college, I was preparing to go on a mission and someone told me, he said, if you really, really want to make a difference, a difference in the world, both for yourself and for others, he said, I would really think about engineering. He said, you may not have any better opportunity to make a difference out there in the world than in engineering. And I would say, so one, I would say, if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, if you don't have your patriarchal blessing, I would tell you to go get one. And if you do have it, review it often. It, it has been a guide throughout my career. And that's all I'll say about that. But um, what I'd say is that advice that I was given is probably more true today than it was for me when I was selecting major. And I'll just talk to you about a, just a couple of projects that I, I was excited to be on that really, I think, bore out that advice from him. So Venice, uh, you probably have heard of Venice, right? A city in, in Italy built on an island in a lagoon. The lagoon is, is mostly protected from the Mediterranean by a narrow strip of land, but there's three natural inlets there. And the problem is at high tide and, and in a storm surge, right, it's prone to flooding. Right? And if you've ever been there, sometimes you'll see they have uh, planks of wood and some kind of scaffolding so that when it is flooding and if you're there, you can walk on this, this wood maybe three feet above the ground. Well, the flooding creates a lot of problems, you can imagine. Businesses, um, homes, uh, all the uh, national treasures that are in uh, Venice, churches and other buildings. And so what they set out to do is an $8 billion project was to build a temporary mobile dam to block those inlets at the time that was ripe for flooding. And the reason that they needed to be temporary or mobile was that they wanted to maintain the environment where it was an active living lagoon and you had that water going free to go back and forth between the sea and the lagoon. So essentially what they did, they made massive concrete blocks or caissons, flooded the area where they poured them, floated them out to where they needed them, sunk them down and positioned them in place, and then put these hollow steel gates on top. And when they were full of seawater, they would sit flat on these blocks. And so sea life, everything else was free to, to go back and forth the lagoon. And then when it was a storm surge or whatever was going to occur, they'd pump those gates full of compressed air, seawater out of them, and the gates would come up and come up out of the water and essentially block these inlets. And these inlets are like big five football fields wide kind of thing and block these inlets and set up a barrier um, to keep the, the sea from flooding Venice. So if you like big infrastructure projects that have environmental impact, you're in the right place with engineering. Um, I'll touch on it quickly. Chernobyl, probably heard of it. Chernobyl almost 40 years ago was the site of the worst nuclear power um, disaster accident uh, that's ever occurred. And in 2016, what they did, it was still, you know, here 40 years later, highly radioactive. You can't get near uh, near the site. They built the largest movable structure to be able to house it and protect the environment from it. And the reason it needed to be movable is you couldn't build it over the old exploded uh, reactor because of how radioactive it is. And so they built this thing, 36,000 tons, 
over a football field high, more than a football field and a half wide, and then lifted and slid it into place uh, over the Chernobyl reactor with remote cranes that couldn't, you know, further decommission the site. So, um, fun project to be a part of uh, there. This one, I don't know if it's really the benefit of mankind. Anybody rode on the Vegas High Roller observation wheel? Oh, I see at least, okay, a few hands. Okay, good. Maybe it has better some people's lives. So observation wheel that could fit 1,100 people on it at a time. Uh, 40 people in each one of those in, in those capsules and engineering marvel and, and fun to be a part of, of equipment that both for the construction and safe operation of, uh, uh, of that. And then more recently in energy... Uh, transition type stuff, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, carbon capture in the uh, company that I'm at now uh, and part of it. But here's, here's what I want you guys to think about. There are tectonic shifts going on in industries right now that people don't see in their entire careers and they're going on right now. So if you think about energy and what's happening, not a lot has changed in energy. And now this massive investment going into green renewable fuels, um, biofuels, um, green hydrogen, I mentioned there, sustainable aviation fuel. There is so many opportunities there. Or you think about automotive, right? Cars have been basically, you know, propelled by the same technology for decades and decades. And now this mass sort of electrification that's going on in the automotive industry is creating tons of opportunity. You think environmental and the stuff that's going on there, medical, artificial intelligence. If there's one thing that I am extremely jealous of you guys and where you are in your careers, it's that you is where you are versus where these shifts in technology are happening. And I would think about this when you think about your internship, when you think about where you want to focus, maybe you want to do a master's in, where you think about where you want to take your first job is these types of opportunities don't come along often. Don't think that you're seeing these things and these happen often. You just happen to be at the right place at the right time. And I would think about that from a chance to be a pioneer in some of these industries, to be open up a ton of opportunity with the investment that's going on, to think about that as you're making some of your choices. So first job. Uh, I went to a company called Western Hills, Darcy and I, and we had uh, our first daughter, uh, Taylor, at the time, packed up, went to Orlando, Florida to work for this storied engineering company founded by George Westinghouse. He was this kind of Thomas Edison type character. He was a pioneer in electrical distribution. The uh, reason I was excited about it was gas turbines. And gas turbines are like jet engines, stationary jet engines for power generation, and included things like heat transfer, where I did my, my master's work in, combustion, uh, aerodynamics, compressible fluid flow, all kinds of cool stuff in that. And I got there, and I kind of thought it would be a little bit like my master's work, and it was much different, let me just say that. And so I was an application engineer, and what we were doing was we were trying to predict the performance of a gas turbine under different conditions so that it could be sized right for customer needs. And we're using this program to come out with answers, and then we would put all these correction factors on the answers because they wouldn't be wrong. Or they would be wrong, and then we'd put them into another algorithm to to further refine it and get the answers we needed. And I started asking some dumb questions at the time. It was like, why doesn't the computer program give us the right answer? And I got answers like, well, you know, no single computer program can really do that. Technology's changing, that sort of thing. And the more people I asked had different answers. And what it really turned out to be was the program had been developed 25 years or more before that, and nobody was around that had developed the program, and nobody wanted to open up this Pandora's box and see what was going to be released if they actually looked at what was going on in the code. So I was able to get some of the source, I was able to get access to the source code. It was in a, in a primitive language called Fortran, which I happen to be educated here at BYU in. And I started working my way through this code, and I had to ask a ton of questions because I didn't know things. And it eventually turned into this year-long project with the whole team in 
figuring out how this computer code worked, documenting it, changing it, and being able to make a difference. And this is what I would say, say to you guys is one of the biggest differences, difference makers in your career will be taking this problem solving methodology that you're being, being sort of ground into you here at BYU. And I know you're probably coming from trying to do some assignment where it took you forever and you're wondering what kind of applicability is this going to have in my first job or whatever. I would say it's going to have a lot, right? And if you keep asking why, you're going to find places where you can make a difference. And I say in here, be the somebody. You're going to find yourself saying, somebody ought to do this. So I heard that, right? Somebody ought to do something about this computer program that doesn't give the right answer. Somebody ought to do this. And for you, the key is, when do you be that somebody? Right? And then the last bullet there, don't wait for an official mandate. Right? Typically, they don't. Some of the best things that happen at work is you do it in your spare time and try to make a difference in your spare time. And I'll say it'll be the number one thing for your job satisfaction doing something like that, and it'll get you noticed. And there'll be opportunities for you in your first year in your career to do that. So two years after joining Westinghouse in um, Florida, we got the opportunity to go to Japan. Now, part of that was I served a mission in Japan, so I spoke the language. The real reason probably is those that were more qualified and more experienced didn't want to go. But I would, I would, I would say for you is think about opportunities to expect assignments. One, missions don't underestimate the impact they can have on your career. It's not just about foreign missions or foreign speaking. The things you learn, the people that you meet, can have big impacts on your career. For me. My first plane trip was to Japan as a missionary. And then since then, I've been to all these different countries and 3 million miles of travel and, and, and global um, business relationships have been some of the most satisfaction, part, high satisfaction for me in my, in my career. But anyways, we, uh, so we packed up. We had our oldest daughter uh, there. There's Darcy with our, actually our son that was born while we were in Japan and, and Taylor. Uh, over there, great from a, a culture and all that sort of standpoint, and and fantastic. Would recommend it to everybody. But I'd say even more importantly, from a career standpoint, what can happen when you go to an outpost? Could be still here domestically, could be uh, foreign. For me, I was the only person at Westinghouse working over there, and I was working at a company called Mitsubishi, and they were joint venture partners uh, in combustion. So it made sense to have an engineer over there but because i was the only person there i got pulled into everything and so an executive would come over from westinghouse and partly because i need language but mostly just being polite and being nice he'd pull me pull me into the meetings there and i i just got fascinated by the way business worked the way they looked at technology as a create, to create differentiation competitive differentiation and value and it really changed what I want to do and where I want to go. And so what I would say is you're going to find in your career, one, engineering is a great place and platform for a lot of different directions after. And for me, as I started getting on the business side, I really wanted to combine it um, with what I was doing in engineering. So we got back from uh, Japan after three years, spent another year in Florida, Finally got in the house, had another child, our, our son, uh, Parker, who's here with us uh, today, and um, made the decision to go back to business school, which is a tough decision, is to go back to school once you start getting comfortable. You're used to not doing homework at nights and, and having some of the, the stress that, that school can cause you. You like having some money and all that sort of thing. You know, it was great being in a house finally. Uh, and so Darcy agreed, we'd go back, to, and it could be for anything, business school or whatever, and you can think about whether you want to do it part-time, whether you want to do it full-time and, and be poor, but be able to be focused or be able to do it as part of your job. Um, but Darcy sent me up to Boston to find a place to live. She never has made that mistake since. So I, uh, you know, I had two things in mind. I, I wanted it to be cheap, 
and I wanted to be close to school. So we lived in a pretty sketchy apartment with our three children for two years with not a great uh, elementary school for our oldest. Uh, we were the only ones there that had three children, but I'll tell you what, this is what I, I learned is two years go by quickly. So if you, if there's a sacrifice there worth making, it'll go by fast. If you want to go back to school and think about it, and I would really encourage you to think about that as you're in your career and, and, and don't wait too long if that's what you end up doing. And then I, the last bullet point there before we move on is what I learned at Harvard was our background here, the foundation that we get here, the quality of education, the quality of students that come out of here can compete with anybody in the world in any place you want to go. And so what I'd say is, one, make the most of the time that you have here but then have a ton of confidence coming out of here that you can be successful in whatever you want to do. Um, that, that I truly believe, and that's why uh, so many of our family all got degrees from here. I think we have 14 degrees, or soon we'll have, and 12 of them came from BYU, just because I think the preparation, the values that are taught here, all those things come together for some really, really solid foundations. So I want to just spend a couple of minutes uh, on this and, and then we'll rapidly run out of time, but choosing a path, I think this is so important. When I exited Harvard, I had a lot of options and probably too many options. And you're gonna face some really difficult decisions. You probably already have if you've chosen a major. If you haven't, you're, you're, you're in the middle of, of, of that difficult decision. If you're thinking about internships, first jobs, those are difficult decisions to make and has to go. And, and just a quick aside, right? President Nelson tells a story of how earlier in his career, he was offered a job to go from the University of Utah to the University of Chicago. He took his wife up there, said it was great. I decided I was going to go and, and take that job. I came back. He was serving as a state president. He told the people he was serving with he was going to move. And somebody said, hey, I think you should talk to President McKay, who was the president of the church at the time. Now, the church was smaller, of course, but he's like, I'm sure he's not going to care. And, and and long story short, he has a chance to consult with President McKay. McKay. President McKay thinks about it and gives him some really good advice. Point of the story is these are difficult decisions. Uh, you probably won't get a chance to consult with a prophet on your first job. If he offers it to you, take him up on it. But so when I was graduating, I tried I tried doing you know what engineers do, right? I was using Pew Matrix or where you try and look at all the things you're that are important to you and weight them and then say here's the opportunities and score it and stuff and it just wasn't feeling right. I had this I had what I thought was my dream job offer, right? Forty percent of the graduating class were going into investment banking and I guess I didn't want to make a lot of money because I chose not to do that and 40% were going to consulting, and I had my job there, and, and it was gonna take us back to Seattle where Darcy was from, and it just, it just wasn't feeling right. And so this is what I would say is, learn to trust that feeling when something's telling you maybe this isn't right. And again, these, these decisions aren't good and bad. It'd be a lot easier to make them. It may be what's better and best, and, and you don't have a crystal ball a lot of times, but like Spider-Man, he always knew when danger was there. What I'm saying is if you hear that voice is, it may not mean it's the wrong decision, but it may mean that you need to ask some more questions. It's easy, especially when you're getting out of here, is to let small money differences, relatively small, and they might seem like large, to impact your decision and where you're gonna go. I would say try to resist that urge. Things will work themselves out. Careers are a marathon, they're not a sprint. Um, and then building your brand. We don't talk about brand much in, uh, in engineering. And what I, would, what I say by that is, how is that next job at the current company, how's that next company that I'm thinking about going to, how's that next degree I wanna get, how is it building my skills, my experience level to be able to compete in the marketplace? Right, and so think about what is your personal brand, what is your expertise, and where where is it building, and it'll evolve over time. And I have pray in there, and pray shouldn't be at the last bullet, it shouldn't be at the first bullet, it should be every bullet. I would combine every one of those steps with prayer. Um, so 
so I went to uh, Husco International. It w went to Wisconsin. Darcy and I and now our three children packed up and went to a place. We had to look on a map where it was. So it's kind of embarrassing. I didn't know where. Well, any, anybody from Wisconsin here? All right. We got some. So ended up loving it. Ended up being home for 20, 20 plus years. But I went to this uh, private family-owned company. And when I I mentioned that I... I've made decisions because of people I want to work for or with. This is one of those decisions. So the person who owned it was a graduate from Harvard. And I, knew, I thought I could learn a ton from it. It was a global, it was a highly engineered, in this case, valve. So it fit with my undergraduate degree um, and just felt right. And it was what they were trying to do is they were selling valves to people like Caterpillar and John Deere. So think about off-highway construction equipment, agriculture equipment. And they want to take it to the automotive world. And so they were looking for a general manager. And so that's what I had gone back to business school on my great courses. This division didn't exist. So I was general manager of nothing, but I was general manager. But so our first, our first project was with Mercedes that we won. And it was this the body control suspension system, cool hydraulic system that a suspension system that could change its characteristics by the driver and how they're driving the surface of the road and all that sort of stuff. Only problem is we didn't have a product. We didn't have a factory that could meet automotive standards. We didn't have any automotive experience. We didn't have any clean room production experience. But other than that, we had everything we needed. So we we made, we were the only ones who could make a prototype that worked. And that's why they, they were forced to go with us. But I remember uh, one of the, someone from way up, we were, we were going through the launch and they're going through the launch of their vehicle. We're going through the launch of this suspension system and it was not going well. And we had about three months to go. And so someone hopped on the Mercedes uh, jet uh, from Germany and flew into Wisconsin on a Saturday and said, hey, every week that you're late is going to cost $40 million. And I'm sitting there going, well, I'm glass on my company. No, I, it, you know, you took a big risk to go here and now I'm starting to feel a little bit of cold feet like I don't have any automotive experience. I'm talking to this, this person that I've gone to, to work for and I'm like, I don't know if you read my resume closely, but I I don't have it. And he's like, Mark, you've got everything you need. You both graduated from the same business school. You graduated from a great engineering school. You have got everything you need to be successful. And this is what I learned from him. Um, this is what he loved to say. Be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. Right? It was He was about taking intelligent risks, right? And then doing and controlling everything that you can control. And you'd be surprised what you can accomplish there and this is what I would tell you is that you're going to be making decisions throughout your career they're going to have risk inherent in them right there's going to be this fog I would call it of uncertainty and ambiguity right and so one of the things I want you to take away from today is you've got what you need you're building the foundation what you need leverage everything you can while you're at BYU to build that foundation and you will surpri be surprised at the things you can accomplish out there. And that's that was the main thing that I that I learned from him. Um, I, I then had, I thought I was going to be in Wisconsin for three to five years. Here's the other thing about careers. You, boy, you have plans and plans go, you know. So I was, I was there 11 years and then I had, a, had the opportunity to go run a, a business in public um, space. And I wish we had time to talk a little bit more about sort of the pros and cons of public, private equity, and private family owned uh, from, but this was a publicly owned company. And this is the one thing that I'll share with you is that they were a market share leader. They do hydraulics. So this is where I did a lot of those big infrastructure projects that I shared with you earlier. They do custom lifting equipment and tools and different things like that. And they were this global leader, market share leader, um, profitable, and I was like, what can I possibly bring to this company? And this is what I learned is every company has tons of room for improvement. And the whole key for you in your careers and what's going to make you more successful than almost anything else is finding where are those opportunities in your first job, in your first group that you're in, as to where you can bring that improvement to. Where, where can you impact it? And again, it may not come in a, official, hey, you're supposed to do this. It may come in your spare time, but there'll be opportunities for you and there'll be nuggets in your career to go after. Um, and this is where I am, am today, uh, Sundine. So we packed up from Wisconsin. Well, we didn't pack up. Actually, here's, 
here's the one lesson here. So this is private equity owned business. It's uh, compressors and pumps for the energy industry and some other industries. So this is where I've worked on green hydrogen and carbon capture and those types of types of applications. But our youngest daughter was in high school. Um, it was a turnaround situation where they wanted to sell a company in a, in a year and a half. And I didn't want to keep moving her um, from, uh, from school and, and back and forth. So I, I commuted from Wisconsin. And this is a time when I got way out of balance. So, and what I would say is going back to that balance thing is I don't think you can maintain balance every minute of your career. There's going to be times you're out of balance. For me, it was 100% on the road. I was serving as bishop at that time, so I was trying to do my calling when I was back in town on the weekends um, and ended up doing it for three years. But when you do get out of balance, you've got to know what is your family situation can they deal with it? Can you deal with it? And when is the end, end game for that? Since then, I've moved to, uh, to Colorado and love it. Here's my kind of last takeaway that I had for you before we, before we wrap up. You're going to get out of here and you're going to think, this is the way careers go, right? Trying to onward and upward. And you can think about that as being in titles. You can think about it as being in areas of responsibility, money, whatever it is right? And, and that's the way it feels like it should. And what I would say is careers are messy, right? There are things that happen to you outside of your, of your control. There's things that may have been inside your control that you've made mistakes, whatever it might be. Your family situation might change. Health situation might change. Um, there's, there's a whole host of things. But if you go into it knowing, right, you've got a plan. It's okay to have a plan but recognize this is how almost every career goes. And if you get the res and if you build the resilience and you look at it with the right perspective, these can be building times rather than really depressing times. So, let me let me just some final takeaways here is never get too high. I don't know if if you haven't read it, go back and read a talk by Elder Uchtdorf. Uh probably was 10 years ago and he talked about how he was with President Faust and he was the junior apostle and and never get too full of yourself. So when things are going well, and you seem like you're you're the reason for it, don't buy into it, right? Don't get too high and don't get too low when everything seems to be your fault. And what I would say is, we live our lives forward, it said, but we only understand them backwards. If you could take one point, the setbacks are a learning opportunity, and when that time comes, you might get laid off company might close its doors whatever it is is remember that right and it's so much easier to, to see it in hindsight once you've lived through it if you can see it in in looking forward you'll be all the better and then coming back to the original point of keep your career in perspective if you do that you'll be much more successful Thank you for being here with me. Thank you for, for you know, you're the back half of the, of the semester. I know things are extremely busy. I know there's a basketball game going on and all that. Thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it.